We tend to take it for granted that our food comes from the soil. You see them in a page, they inspire you. If we don't all come together, wildlife will disappear. My name is Tandiwe Mwetwa, and I'm a wildlife biologist from Zambia. Um, I work for an organization called the Zambian Carnival Program, and most of the work I do is centered around predator conservation, so lions, leopards, dogs, hyenas, but there's also a community component to what I do. My name is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Toluojo. I currently serve as Director of Operations for the School of Wildlife Conservation at ALU. ALU is the African Leadership University. My name is Dr. Shivani Bala. I'm the Executive Director of Iwaso Lions, a community-based conservation project up in Samburu and Isiolo of Northern Kenya. I'm here in Kenya to take part in the Pathways Women's Training. Um, well, that finished, but it's, it's just been an amazing past few days. This is the first time Pathways has been done in Kenya. Um, and the organizers, the Pride Lion group, have been very deliberate about getting as many women as possible out here, right? So when I talked to my boss about it, he said, you know, I think you're good, you can add value to that, to that meeting. And I said, sure, like, I'd like to be there. Um, so yeah, that's why I'm here. This is the amazing Namanyak. She's such a beautiful lion. I work with an amazing team working to conserve Kenya's lions. The last lions I saw was the, the dying little poor cub. Um, so it's nice to see these guys again. Kenya's lions are in serious threat. They're declining all across our country. And we're working with women, warriors, children to really reverse the trend, the decline of lion numbers. I keep very busy running this project with my amazing team. At the same time, I am a founding member of the Pride Lion Conservation Alliance, which is about collaboration, inclusion, bringing conservationists together to innovate and do more for conservation. For a long time, I worked in the field with really amazing men, but it was always just me in the, in the team. And the longer I stayed in the field, I recognized the need for multiple contributions from different sectors of our community. And so that's how I thought and talk to, 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 to the people I work with, like, why don't we start a training program that would just give opportunity to these women to get out in the field. And what happened was we, we weren't really going initially to say, okay, we're going to pick you because of ABCD, but we opened the door basically and just invited anybody to walk through. Because I believe it's a matter of giving people exposure because if you're not exposed to a certain thing, you won't really think of it as something that you can do, as something that you would be interested in. In some cases, you know, it, it, it hasn't worked the way I'd imagine. People have been with me in the field and be like, oh my God, I hate it. <laughs> I don't want to sleep in an open Land Rover with lions roaring all around. And other people have just been like, oh my God, this is what I've been looking for. So it's, it's, it goes both ways and, and for me it's been quite rewarding really to see the people that I've worked with proceed to go into this field like full on and actually doing the things that they learned from our site in a different part of the country. I was born and raised in Lagos, Nigeria, so I grew up in a concrete jungle, one of the biggest on the continent. And so that makes it even more unusual that I would end up in conservation, right? Um, one of my very first environmental passions and still is one of my primary passions is litter. Right, so unlike Nairobi, because I lived in Nairobi for two years and I always made that comparison for my friends. I'm like, you guys have it relatively good in the city. It's not as dirty as we have it in Lagos, it's fact. Kigali is, is a different bogey mentality. That's like squeaky clean, right? But Lagos still battles with litter and waste management. And that just always got under my skin. Maybe because I'm male and my mom taught me that everything has its place. And so seeing litter on the road and people throwing litter out the window just always, always, always set me off on a weird path. Um, so there was that passion sort of in the background. Now, trying to get into university, I thought I wanted to be a medical doctor. I know, right? It's what everybody did. You were either an engineer, a lawyer, or a doctor. Well, I didn't get into school for medicine. Instead, I got into school for microbiology. And being a determined woman who was not going to quit, I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna, let's see what comes out of this, right? And so I pushed through three years of it. And in my final year, we started doing different 
you know, sub-branches of microbiology. And that was where the professional side of me, you know, started exploring the environmental space because we did environmental microbiology. And at that point, it was about, okay, how can we use microorganisms to fix hydrocarbon degradation in the coastal areas of Nigeria, right? So basically, oil spills were happening all the time. And there's this idea, and it's been practiced a little bit, that you can use microorganisms to clean up the oil. But as I started doing my research in that area, I started researching other spaces of the environmental network. And I thought, wait a minute, this is what I'm personally passionate about. It's like, why are people throwing things out the window? And there are people who do this for a career. And by the time I was done with my first degree, I thought, you know what, I want to do a master's in environmental management. Like, this is what I've always been passionate about, so let's, let's do it. So I went to Yale and I spent two years doing a master's in environmental management. This was five years after I had lived in the south east, south south of the country. While I was there, I did started doing some volunteer work, right? Like trying to really get my hands into this environmental space. And some of my clearest memories are planting mangrove trees in mud, right? So you get into these knee-high rain boots. <laughs> And then you get these seedlings and like get mud up to your ankles, up to your elbows rather, trying to put new mangrove seedlings into the, into the ground. I grew up looking at wildlife. I was very lucky as a child. My parents took me on safari and I would see so many lions in Masaimara. I would see hundreds of elephants. I would see so many um, at different antelope. But now as a conservationist, I don't see that anymore. I don't see those big prides of lions and I don't see what I grew up seeing. And for me, that's a fundamental problem. And as a Kenyan, I can't, I can't accept that. And, you know, I look at our coat of farms. I look at how lions are synonymous across Kenya. But the reality is, if we don't all come together, lions will disappear, wildlife will disappear. And then what? We never want to get to a stage where we say, it's too late. We didn't do anything about it. So we're trying to get a location for the color that we picked up. Being out in nature provides you with the most powerful experiences. In my own experience, it was being in the presence of three young male lions that had just come into a, you know, this call in we had we'd set up. And, and they just sat around the vehicle less than three meters away and they just started roaring in, at the top of their voices. The power of that, the vehicle was shaking. I could feel the organs inside my body vibrating along with their, with, 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 with their calls. And it was just, you know, I felt like I'm in the right place. This is what I want to do forever. And, and just being out in nature in this particular field can be exciting. It can be like, you know, a little beautiful flower you see, you know, like this lady was telling us yesterday at the top of the mountains that have been transformational. So it's those things. And then there's also the aspect of people. So a lot of us get into conservation through the science lens, right? And then your mind gets opened up to a much broader aspect. You look at it and say, okay, conservation is not just about lions or giraffes or gravy zebra or anything about it. It's also about the people living side by side with those villages, with, with those species. And so you're constantly thinking, how do I balance both? It can be frustrating at times, but when good things happen, it's deeply satisfying you, you know, aligning your love for these amazing species, but also your need to serve these people that live alongside them and protect them and, you know, coexist with them. So it's, that, that's what I love, it's balancing those two. We tend to take it for granted that our food comes from the soil, that our water comes from forest, that trees purify our air, um, that we live on land. If you've lived or you know anyone who lives on an island that has disappeared, you'll understand that it's no joke to have half of the land under your island disappear. And literally, a, a prime minister has to move all of his people and look for somewhere else for an entire nation to go. And that's happened already, right? Um, so it's important to have these discussions because our lives depend on the environment. The truth is nature can actually do without us, but we can't do without nature. That's just the fact of the matter. And so the sooner we start thinking about it that way, the better off we'll be. Um, but in my opinion, you know, making a difference is first of all about an appreciation and an awareness. For me, 
being aware of what was happening in the Niger Delta in Nigeria and of how people's farmlands were getting polluted by oil and how that was completely disrupting their lives made me more aware that driving, being in my mother's car and being driven from home to school was causing someone else a major problem because some things were missing in the middle, right? Um, going out into the Mara with my husband uh, for our honeymoon and just experiencing those outdoors gave me a love for nature. And so the first thing I'd encourage people to do is visit the Mara instead of Dubai for your next holiday. Just go out there and start developing an appreciation for nature. See what's out there. See what's outside of your concrete jungle. When you start doing that, and while you're out there, you talk to the safari guide that is driving you around town, it will start to stir something up within you that is a passion for the environment. Then you can start to think about, okay, turning my tap off when I'm not using the water, turning the lights off when I'm not in that particular room, turning the water heater off when I'm not there, you know, using my clothes one or two more times because I don't need to wash it just yet because they're not quite dirty, right? Um, but it starts with that appreciation, just recognizing that these things are, it's, this is beautiful, right? And there's really, human beings are attracted to beauty. And so there's really no reason to destroy it. But it starts with that appreciation. Some of our research activities include lion monitoring, where we monitor 40 lions in the region. And each lion has been individually identified using their whisker spot pattern. One of the biggest challenges we're facing is time is running out. Animals are disappearing and landscapes are becoming more degraded. Communities are struggling. There is so much disappearing. And for myself as a Kenyan, I feel there's something very wrong about that. We cannot let wildlife disappear from our country. It is so important that Kenyans come together to protect what is so important to us and what is ours to protect. Lions are declining. We have less than 2,000 lions left in the whole country. We have bees that are, being di that are disappearing. We have rangelands that are being degraded. We have elephants that are being poached. We have so much that's declining at such a rapid, rapid pace, and there's so little time now. But there is hope. If we can come together, if we can collaborate, if we can work together, if we can be inclusive, if we can involve diverse voices, if we can engage the communities who are living with wildlife, we can reverse these trends. We can bring back wildlife. And now, this is the time. There's, we, can't, we can't wait and say, we'll do this next year. We'll do this in a couple of years time. Time is so short that we have to act. The time I, I joined um, the organization I'm working with, my uncle was really worried that I wasn't going to come back home. So there's a, <laughs> there's a danger aspect to, like, oh, you're going to go in the field, you're going to camp out at night, you're going to be among you know, all these dangerous game. What measures are in place for you to be safe? So there's that concern from families that comes from a good place and maybe it, I don't want my daughter exposed to these elements. But then there's also, I think, the cultural aspect in certain places. We do these jobs that require us to, you know, dress differently. So for example, in my country, we wear these, we call them chitenges, and it's a staple of like any girl's wardrobe, basically. And a lot of the time you spend a good amount of time in that. And then you join this job that requires you to wear pants for safety reasons, for efficiency. And it's like, you know, are you trying to throw away our culture? Do you? So I, I think it's getting to a point where you're saying, if I join this field, I can still be a deeply traditional person and still do the job that I love well. So it's also, it, it can be from a cultural standpoint and, or from a traditional standpoint. And in some cases, it's just looking at certain jobs because in conservation, most people get in like through the sciences and you know, many people, I don't know about Kenya, where I come from, we believe girls are for the business courses, the English courses, the arts, and the science is more for the boys. So they don't really imagine themselves taking on that full scientific role. Or they don't think of it as something that they can excel at. So that's why I believe exposure and putting people in, this, in, in the moment, in, the, in, in those particular places, that's what opens their mind up to all these possibilities and builds confidence. Issues of how a growing city can manage population growth and preserve green spaces so that everything doesn't get run by people, it, it takes 
in some cases, yes, you need policy level decisions that are going to say, okay, this area, we're not touching it. But you need people who are going to stand up and be the crazy person like Wangari Mathai. I'm going to do the madness that nobody else wants to do. Stand up for it and go through all of that suffering. And, and it's easy to discredit or to forget the hard work that went into that. But when you drive past Karura Forest now, like it's such a beautiful patch of green. You know, you're going from the concrete city of Karen, you know, or further up, up in Gong Road, and you pass Karura and it's like, huh. You, you literally feel the fresh air coming out of there. You know, even if you don't go in for recreation, which so many Kenyans and, and foreigners alike enjoy, you know, just driving past gives you a little hope about the next meeting you're going to. Then there's the, 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 how it improves the quality of life in Nairobi, just the better air quality, um, and then water purification, and those kinds of things that, again, you can easily take for granted, but you have to accredit the one crazy person who said, I'm gonna put my foot down and say, we're not gonna cut this place down, right? And you need many more women and and men like that who will stand up for what they believe, regardless of what it's going to cost them. Your Excellency, 73% of the participants are from 19 African countries. 59% of the registrants are women. To increase participation and accessibility for local and regional practitioners, and the organizers provided 70 scholarships to cover the full cost of Pathways Conference registration for African conservationists. So we wanted to give the recipients full access to the conference sessions, the materials, and the networking sessions. This is why it is an implicit part of the Big Four agenda in Kenya. But now these values need to be explicit, and we need your help, Your Excellency. We, it will take the courage of matriarchs to help us change the narrative. And the foresight of patriarchs, we are not leaving you behind, men. To make what we are planning for this continent, its people, and its wildlife a success. The importance of environment and wildlife conservation is an issue that has taken center stage in global conversations. Countries have committed the next decade as critical years to fight against global challenges of climate change. We must accelerate action to achieve sustainable development goal targets by the year 2030. Pathways Africa, this is the third conference that's taken place in Africa, the second one in Kenya. And the theme for this year's conference was open the door to diverse voices, because that is really lacking in conservation. And if we bring in women who are so neglected when it comes to conservation de decision making, there's such an imbalance in conservation leadership. So they're one voice that's got to be heard. Communities, diverse voices from around the world, we can actually make a difference. And through this conference, we have diverse voices from all over. But what's really exciting is 73% come from Africa. And that was our goal. We want African conservationists to come together. We want them to have conversations. We want them to have discussions. What keeps us all together and what makes us all on the same page are the shared values we have. The more we have balanced teams, the more we're likely to arrive at workable solutions that will be you know, feasible for the rest of society. And, and it's just, you know, I'd, I'd like people to have the experiences I've had. I've had the most life-changing experiences on my job. You know, moments that actually give you goosebumps because you are in the presence of just these amazing species treating you to the music that they just produce from these bodies and you've got no understanding of how that happens. I, I want people to have the experiences I've had and also bring their opinions and solutions to the table. Issues of how a growing city 
can manage population growth and preserve green spaces so that everything doesn't get overrun by people. It, it takes, in some cases, yes, you need policy level decisions that are going to say, okay, this area, we're not touching it, but you need people who are going to stand up and be the crazy person like Wangari Mathai and going to do the madness that nobody else wants to do. Stand up for it and go through all of that suffering. And, and it's easy to discredit or to forget the hard work that went into that. But when you drive past Karura Forest now, like it's such a beautiful patch of green you know you're going from the concrete city of karen you know or further up up in gong road and you pass karura and it's like huh. you can literally feel the fresh air coming out of there you know even if you don't go in for recreation which so many kenyans and, and foreigners alike enjoy you know just driving past gives you a little hope about the next meeting you're going to then there's the the, the how it improves the quality of life in nairobi just the better air quality um, and then water purification and those kinds of things that again you can easily take for granted but you have to accredit to the one crazy person who said I'm going to put my foot down and say we're not going to cut this place down right and you need many more women and men like that who will stand up for what they believe regardless of what it's going to cost them um, it, it's it's so easy to be selfish and think about me and my family and what's best for me but every now and again we need to step out of our comfort zones and do what's best for, for the society at large really um, yeah, so I, I remember doing an event to honor Wangari Mathai at Yale and planting a couple of trees behind our new Kroon Hall building. And it was a teary moment, you know, just celebrating such a great woman from far away on the other side of the ocean. Um, and I, I wish that we had more people like that at home in Nigeria who would who will stand up and, and make those calls to say, look, and we, we have had a couple of them, Ken Sarowiwa and some other really great people who are saying, okay, look, this can't happen like this, you know, we need to protect this place and we can't behave like that. Um, but we need more and more of them. And that's why meetings like this are important because we come here, we encourage each other. I see what some of my friends are doing. I'm like, I need to go do more. <laughs> I'm getting comfortable, I need to go do more back at home. So that's the other reason why meetings like this are important. It, it provides a, a place for ginger, like we like to call it at home, where you come and you get ginger, and you go back and do more. Women make up 51% of the world's population, and we're responsible for everyday decisions about food, water, security, and health. Bigger participation of women in this space is critical if we're to meet the challenges of climate change. Unfortunately, as in many other sectors, the contribution of women in conservation has been overlooked. This leadership training, whose theme is open the door to diverse voices, is timely so that women are empowered with knowledge and tools to participate in decision-making on issues that affect their livelihoods, their health, their families. The experience here will expand opportunities for collaboration and innovation. It will promote a collective vision that will positively contribute to greater conservation impact across Africa. I have also been inspired by my role model, Wangari Mathai a legend, a great icon, and a great source of pride for our country, for her great legacy in environmental conservation. We will forever be indebted to her for her relentless sacrifice. Because of what she taught us, we are reminded that lots of work still needs to be done to make the planet safe for our children. <laughs>